I work in a library, but by no means am I a librarian. I'm a multimedia production specialist at the University of Nevada, Reno, and I got my degree in electrical engineering. Our goal is to use digital literacies and traditional technologies to enhance learning, teaching, and understanding. In the library, I work alongside librarians, researchers, and teachers whose job is to accurately archive the past. The value of any archive lies in the reactions it elicits from present and future audiences. It's the ability to revisit a point in history or to learn a new idea for the first time. Recently, our department has added virtual reality to its list of specialties. And it's this intersection of VR and a library context that I find particularly important. Now, I know it's typical to think of virtual or augmented realities for video games or simulations. Actually, in preparation for this talk, I used an application called Ovation VR that allowed me to simulate this very stage and audience inside a virtual reality headset so that I could spare myself from having to visualize all of you in your underwear. <laughs> but options like this are hard not to think of a dystopian future, like the book and movie Ready Player One, where people are glued to their alternate realities, escaping from the real world in front of them. So instead of focusing on what VR is doing for our future, what is virtual reality doing for our past? As you can imagine, libraries are constantly organizing and maintaining a variety of special collections, from photos and papers, books and videos. Digitizing these types of items is known, but how do you digitize an actual sculpture or a building? What about an artifact? That's where my team comes in. Currently, we are in the process of 3D scanning and modeling the unique material collections of the university. By tying these digital copies to context and creating metadata to express their invaluable significance. By using virtual reality, we can take this one step farther and interact with them in virtual ways. You can pick items up, you can inspect minute details. From this moment forward, we can utilize virtual reality to archive items of importance and even moments in time. By using 360 video as archivists, we can transport the participant as if they were actually in that moment. Because when you watch a 360 video inside a virtual reality headset, you're not just looking at a TV monitor or looking at your phone. The video is all around you. And in some ways, you are inside the video by stepping your consciousness into someone else's perspective. I first realized how important this technology was when I met Evan. Evan is a university student who lives with cerebral palsy. He has three degrees and he's working on his fourth currently. When I first met Evan, we decided to have certain experiences in virtual reality for him. And we created 360 videos and had him look inside the virtual reality headset. In the short documentary I filmed called Walking with Reality, it takes Evan on a variety of these 360 video experiences from visiting the Black Rock Desert in Nevada and skiing on top of a mountain. When we first curated these videos for Evan, we were trying to figure out what to do with this new technology. And we were still curious on how to use it. We had no idea how significant it would be to us, but especially for Evan. While he was in awe with visiting the playa for the first time. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. What do you think? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sure. God. None of us could have imagined what happened when we took Evan skiing. Oh, wow. Oh, 
Jesus. I was kids of 15 years old. He made me feel like walking. The video that took Evan skiing wasn't just him experiencing the sensation of gliding on snow. Coincidentally, that video was filmed on the same mountain and the same ski run that Evan had enjoyed on a sit ski 34 years ago. The moment we helped Evan into the headset, he wasn't just inside a simulation, he was recalling what it was like to be a kid again. Evan's message inspired the world and it helped us to reimagine how libraries should think of cultural preservation. And by no means are we the only ones. Organizations like SciArc and the Digital Institute of Archaeology have begun to digitally document and preserve cultural sites all around the world that are subject to human and natural cause degradation. Because face it, human created things are vulnerable and ephemeral. Nothing that we make lasts forever. But by using high fidelity 3D scanning, 3D modeling, and 360 video, we can bring people back to these places and to these moments. 3D blueprints can be made from these 3D models and go beyond preservation to rebuild buildings that have once been damaged. Now, who in here has ever gone to a museum and wanted to touch the things behind the glass? In a real museum, this would never be possible. And to the museum curators out there, I'm sorry for even saying that. But for those of you who have ever wanted to touch those things behind the glass, virtual items and virtual museums don't run the same kinds of risks. Virtual items you can pick up and inspect. And from this moment forward, theoretically, we can observe art and architecture indefinitely in digital formats. And these techniques aren't just trade secrets. You can start documenting and 3D modeling objects around you or things in your community just from your cell phone. You can look up 3D modeling apps and start documenting today. In the past few years, Reno, Nevada has seen an explosion of color in the city. Artists from our town and from around the world have begun painting on our buildings enlivening our sense of pl place for locals and tourists alike. University Libraries was inspired by other recording projects around the world, and we decided to make our own interactive experience. We started by taking thousands of photos, but how can you crane your neck while looking at a photo of a five-story painting on a parking garage? We needed VR to put that into context and to show the true scale. So the documentation of the Reno Street Art Project came into two parts. The first is an online archive that contains the meticulous metadata of every mural and how it was created, who created it, what kind of paint was used. And the second was a virtual map of Reno where people can interact with the murals and explore this map. These 360 videos of the murals are located in their relative locations around the city. So you can inspect and choose whichever mural you want to go to, almost as if you were in a gallery. Now, many of you may be thinking that watching a video of a mural may be what, like watching paint dry, but it's not. There are birds flying overhead, there are people walking by. You can hear cars on the street, and you may be even able to recognize neighborhoods. We even took this one step farther by interviewing artists from our community and wanted to find out their perspective of how this street art is changing and how it affects Reno, Nevada. If you really think about it, this is a very unique way of archival. In some ways, this may be one of the closest versions of tri time travel that we may ever be able to experience as humans. You're able to step back into these moments and stand in them once more. Over the last few years, we've done some of this documentation. And when we were finished with this project, we invited the artists to come back into our studio and to look at the project that we had created. 
although there were hundreds of videos taken, one particular video stood out. The video that you see on screen now is a time lapse of two artists painting inside of a Reno club. One of the artists we worked with throughout the project, but the other artist has since passed away. When we had invited the artist that we worked with to come back into our studio and watch this video and watch our project, I was speechless to know that we had captured such an intimate moment between friends. This wasn't just about preserving the murals or creating a memory of our city. This was preserving the memory of real people that live in our world. As I had said before, the value of any archive lies in the reactions of people who engage with it, how it moves us, how it inspires us. And not all archives live inside museums or libraries. Think of every single photo and video that you take as adding to your own historical record. I personally try to record all of my family moments into 360 video so that my niece and nephews can take a step back to their childhood, to their reality. The real power of this technology does not lie within big companies or universities. The real power of this technology lies within you. It lies within all of us to keep documenting, recording, and preserving for generations to come. I work in a library, and although I may not be a librarian, I hope that one day these virtual and digital archives will mean the world to someone. Thank you.